What's up, Canes fans? Welcome into another edition of the Canes Insight Podcast. I am your host, Peter Ariz, alongside the money fresh off a trip from the Grand Canyon. He was delivering that info, had the bank drop yesterday. If you have not checked that out already, D, appreciate you joining the show as always. How you doing? Doing good, man. Just took the red eye last night. Came straight here from work, as you could see, to, to do the bank. Enjoyed Arizona. Was in Sedona also. Saw some spiritual vortexes, some energy vortexes. Really told the universe, you know, we need a double-digit win season to sign some of these blue-chip players and keep them. And again, Miami back where it needs to be. Last time I was in Arizona was not so fun. It was 2002. You know, I was with my, my wife now. She was my girlfriend at the time. And uh, we got together right before that trip. So it's been a very nice relationship. We're married now, but the 20 years since then have been really brutal for the Canes. So I had to return back to the to the scene of the crime, talk to the the vortexes, you know, talk to the talk to the spirits and, and get things going in the right direction. So you know, my energy is good right now. I'm feeling good about the Canes. Well, excited for this episode. We'll get probably into the you know some of the stuff from the bank, but Juan Manaya, offensive line commit will be joining the show. You can tell how big this guy is just from the face, you know, the FaceTime interview that we did, right? I mean, this is a guy who you see on on Twitter. His nickname is Door, and he had to kind of spell it out for people yesterday asking why that was his nickname because he's the size of, of a door. And he's one of those guys, D, that we've talked about that's more of a projection, but – he says it in his interview, basketball background has the ability to move, and he understands that that's going to be his ticket at the next level. Yeah, the, he put a picture, too, of him in a doorway, and he was a right. size doorway. Um, you know, Mirabal, I heard one of his interviews, and he was saying, mass kicks ass. At the end of the day, size matters. You need to be able to move with that size and that technique and, and temperament and all those things. But size matters. You see it with the Alabamas and the Georgias of the world, Oklahomas. So – Miami's offensive line is starting to look the right way. Minai is a guy who fits that profile to the T. And Mirabal's going to – he's targeting him. He wants to work with him. And now it's his job to get him where he needs to go. Penn State offers – you know, this guy was a three-star, but he had the, the big schools in that area were after him just because that size is so rare. And and without having, you know, too much extra weight or being too slow, the guy's, you know, lean and he can move a little bit. A lot to develop there. As always, Canes fans, like and subscribe – course we have our podcast every week we have the live show every thursday night as well we'll be having that tomorrow stay tuned for the time and potential guests on there i'm hosting every week d hops on there uh every now and then and drops some exclusive info that you can only find on kane's insight Um, but we're dropping instant reaction podcast these days when the news drops and of course stay tuned on canesinsight.com if you don't have a free profile already go on there and sign up again we are on a subscription website go on there for free and we are constantly updating the website with the latest news and if we aren't doing it d money or myself one of the great fans out there on the message board is doing that so yeah 6.3 million posts and counting the most active forums you know if somebody in a picture on Instagram is wearing Kane slippers. It's on Kane's site within five seconds. It's, it's just, it's, it's addictive because how fast the information comes. And of course it's all free and the exclusive stuff like the bank, which I dropped earlier this week. Um, also don't forget the Kane Shopify. You got the, the link in the bio, you got the, the samples on screen underdog fantasy promo code CIS get a hundred dollars play baseball. I mean, this are some great baseball games going on right now. Summer is hot. The pitch clock is rolling. Bet on some of those games, $100 free to play. Underdog Fantasy over-unders. Otani, I don't know who had, who had over uh, one home run yesterday, but you would have won or over you know, nine strikeouts. You got them both. So lay down all kinds That's of That's your guy right there. Oh, I, I go back. I'm a, I'm a Nippon Ham Fighters fan, you know, so I go back <laughs> to those days. Um, but anyways, so get into the what people tuned in for, which is the Miami Hurricanes. Um we we'll do a little Q&A here. Obviously, the bank, you can go on canesinsight.com or on the uh, canes.insight Instagram and check that out. Um, so I won't go over all those stuff I, I discussed there, but I want to answer some questions from fans on the website, on the canesinsight.com forum, some registered members, as well as from Twitter. 
and just kind of go through there. Now, one question I got in a million different ways is who's next to commit? Who, how are we looking with these defensive linemen? And here's the best I can tell you. I had a very good conversation with folks directly tied into this deal. And it's a different kind of approach this year. It's very much, listen, here are the guys we want. Here's our priorities. And it's a lot of names. And I'll go through the, I can go through the names right now shortly. We're taking these guys if they want to come to Miami. Recruit all of them. We're recruiting all of my priorities. The NIL side, which is a different side, has a substantial packages ready for all these guys. They're all priority targets. And I'll go through the names. They've all visited most multiple times through unofficials as well. They're all getting recruited heavily. Now it's just a matter of who's going to close. And sometimes, you know, you see recruitments where it's like, listen, there's a, a guy's just waiting to, to publicly announce. There's a silent. Some other guys are long shots. The attitude I get when I talk to people with these defense alignment, it's almost like a game day approach. Like, all right, we did all the work. We've done all the practice work. Now let's close. Let's execute, close, finish the deal here in July. You know, it's not like, oh, these guys are in the bag. We'll just wait for them to commit. Or they're in the bag somewhere else. It's more like, let's finish the job. We've done the work. Let's finish the job. They're still closing to be done. With NIL, with all the things that happen, it's not like kids are fixed at this point. A lot happens between now and their commitment. That goes to people that are leaning our way or people that are going to have to get to lean our way. It's a lot of work to be done. It's a different attitude. So people ask, you know, someone about to jump in, different varying levels of interest, sure, but really all these guys are firmly in play and things change and Miami's recruiting them all very hard. These are all plus one kids. So just going through who's on that list. Talk about Aiden Breland for sure. Justin Scott for sure. This defensive tackle, David Stone, Artavius Jones. Um, TJ Lindsay on that list as well. Um, Jane Jackson out of IMG and Kendall Jackson, who's a defensive end defensive tackle out of Gainesville and Camarion Franklin from the Mississippi side of Memphis defense end. Same rules apply. Take, take if they want to come Dylan Stewart, number one overall on our board, Marquise Lightfoot, extremely high priority. Um, you know, Franklin and, and Jackson can also play outside at end. These are the names that Miami is pushing for, and, uh, Elias Rudolph. These are the names Miami is pushing for, and they will take any of these guys that they want to come. So it's – I know people want to say, well, who – you know, who are we, who are we, who's closer than others? You'd be surprised if you talk to people who, who actually knew what was going on and were involved at how uncertain a lot of this is. This is still a lot to be played. If you're asking me who I feel good about today as far as better than others, I would say, you know, Justin Scott, Aiden Breland, I, I, um, Artavius Jones from the defensive tackle side are the three I feel best about today, but that can change. Kamari Franklin also, I just, I don't, I haven't been as connected to that recruitment, but, you know, I know he had a very good NIL meeting. He's another one that could we could be good with. David Stone, to me, feels like Oklahoma. Miami's still very confident on David Stone. I get the sense that's going to be a seesaw battle, more so than some of the other guys. Wherever he commits next, if it's Miami, they're going to have to fight for him to keep him. If it's Oklahoma, Miami's going to keep coming after him. So that one's, I think, more one to watch. But the, I, I do feel really good about Artavius Jones after his visit. Aiden Breland had a phenomenal visit two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And um, Justin Scott you know, had a very good visit. The, the issue with him is – getting everybody comfortable with the distance and everything else. But I think Miami is making good progress there when it comes to Dylan Stewart, very similar to Samson Okalola last year. I came on the bank very early and said, look, Samson Okalola, who was not at that time a five-star. I think he was more like a, a mid to high four. I said, this guy is the number one target on the board. He's the number one overall player. That's how they view him as the first guy shaking Goodell's hand. Obviously they prioritize him in a million ways. They got him. This year, that to me, that's Dylan Stewart. Dylan Stewart is the guy, the defensive end out of, out of Washington, D.C. He's the guy where they put him on top of the board, and the words used to describe him, future number one overall pick. And they're going to do whatever it takes to get him. South Carolina's there, Ohio State's there, Georgia's there, but Miami is going to battle that one. But that one's really a battle. That one, I think, is going to have the most fireworks over the next couple of weeks. Um, 
Marquise Lightfoot, I feel like Miami's made a really, really strong move over the weekend. feel very, very good of where Miami sits with Marquise Lightfoot. Guy Miami loves. I uh, visited last weekend. Again, Ohio State thought that the, the inside track. All the crystal balls went off, but I'm told he's very much wide open, and Miami's made a strong impression there. That decision could be coming you know, in, in the weeks to come or sooner than later. Linebacker. Chris Cole is the one guy you'd say is a priority target. I would say the other names you've heard of linebacker, not quite the same priority level, but Chris Cole certainly is one. And Miami thinks they made a major move with Georgia. Again, how is this process going to play out? You know, this is the NIL era. This is, uh, there's a lot of different things going on. So how is the process going to play out? We'll see. But I know Miami made a very good move with him. And Georgia's on other linebackers too. So, you know, who knows how that plays out. But I think Miami feels very good about the direction they're going with Chris Cole. And then defensive back is a very much a wide open position. The one name I'd watch there, uh, Romanus Frederic out of St. Thomas, originally from Deerfield Beach, wide receiver slash corner. For, you heard his name first on canesinsight.com. He's a West Virginia commit, but Miami thinks they can flip him. I think they have a good chance to flip him. And he is a versatile guy. Again, you love those. We haven't had those wide receivers playing corner as much. You know, you had your your Ivies, your your Blades, um, to Corey Couch, guys that didn't play both ways like this. This guy is a receiver, long, who also plays corner and did really good at our camp. So you like the ball skills and the length that he brings to the table. So getting into some of these questions from the website, D. We'll start with J.G. DeCane. Hearing some noise about Riley Williams being the real deal, day one impact kind of guy. Any truth to that? Before you answer that, if you've been listening to the podcast since springtime, then you know what the answer to this is. Yeah, and he was a guy, even going back to when he signed, I remember he didn't get as much excited. Like maybe because it was a series of commitments, people were excited, but it kind of moved on. But it wasn't like a full-on celebration. I mean, this is a guy we beat Ohio State and Alabama for. You know, this was this was a major win, as big as any recruiting win last year, as far as the individual player and where he stacks up at his position. This guy is big. You know, he's legit six five. He's not skinny. He's heavier than some of the other tight ends we brought in that are that are that height. Um, tough, great receiver, great after the catch, fluid. Really a complete tight end. I mean, there's not one thing you look at him and say he's really deficient in this area. Blocking is a work in progress for everybody, but he's not a non-blocker, and he's not soft. The he, In spring, he missed the beginning because he was injured, but once he started playing, flashed huge. You saw him in the spring game catch a touchdown from TBD, uh, showed off his speed down the sideline, looked like a receiver. The battle I'm watching in spring, one of the battles I'm watching, part of me in camp up here in August, will be uh, Jaleel Skinner, and Riley Williams, because you're going to have Elijah Arroyo, uh, McCormick, Cam McCormick, more of the blocking guys who can catch Arroyo, more of a receiver than McCormick. But in terms of the pure receivers that you're flexing and moving around, that's going to be more of your Jaleel Skinner versus Riley Williams. Skinner flashed last year, had some very long catch and runs, particularly in practice, but at the same time, had some drops as well. Skinner to be probably a more fluid, natural receiver. Then Skinner, Skinner's a thoroughbred. Once he gets those strides going, he can cover ground in a hurry. Uh, Riley probably a little more polished. So that's going to be an interesting battle. Has Skinner improved his hands to the point where he's going to seize that spot? I know he's gotten stronger. He broke some tackles in the spring. That's a battle to watch. But, yes, Riley Williams looks every bit of a big-time tight end at Miami. Stacking some chips there in that room for sure. Next question here from Kane's MIA01. Can you please expand on your thoughts of a die? We just had two corners drafted and don't seem close on a top two, four, seven corner. He's got a lot of work to do, uh, you know, because you say, okay, you had two corners drafted. Great. But Miami's pass defense last year was one of the worst in the nation, particularly in terms of explosive plays. We're in the hundreds. So if you have two NFL corners, first team All-America safety, and then a guy like James Williams, who's a five-star, who actually graded out high in coverage according to some of the metrics that are out there. You shouldn't be giving up so many explosive plays. The pass rush was top 10 in terms of sacks, and most of that was with the front four. So why is the back, the back seven and the back, the defensive backs in particular, so leaky? 
It's hard to understand. There's communication issues, but that falls to me on a die. So the fact that we had two NFL corners last year, yes, he should use it as his recruiting pitch. But to me, it raises questions. Why didn't we play better? And then, of course, recruiting. Uh, that cornerback group is probably the room I'm the most concerned about in this class right now. Um, I don't have a great feel for that position. I like Romanus Frederic as far as a camp guy, a local guy, you know, kind of like a Stanley Jean Baptiste who got drafted a few years ago, a guy that developed late, a wide receiver slash corner. Xavier Rhodes, another underrated guy who was a three-star, played corner and, and receiver, ended up going to the NFL. So I like that pickup if we get him. But that position in general is looking very, very uncertain. And I expect a lot of, of movement in that cornerback room particularly Jalen Hayward looking unlikely for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, we won't get into, but that to me is a, is a, is a position to watch. Haynes fan 93 has a couple questions here. Who takes a huge leap this year? Which player are you most excited to see and over under eight sacks for Nigel Leak? I'll just answer to one question, Nigel Lee Kelly, right? Um, I think he is extremely talented. His age, he was young for his grade when he came in. He, I think he came into Miami as a 17-year-old. So he has more development to go. He's had the strong lower body. His upper body's filling out a little bit more. Had a very good spring. And I was told by people in Miami, you know, this is our top prospect in the future. You know, he'll probably be the guy that gets picked the highest on this roster based on what, what he can do. So – Excited to see him over under eight sacks. He had four last year. Um, some of that depends on just circumstance. He might pressure somebody and the other guy gets the sack. I don't know the numbers, but I think he's going to have a big year and is a key player for Miami. Manfred Kane wants to know, have you heard anything in regards to where we stand with Ryan Wingo? Yeah, Ryan Wingo uh, from St. Louis, obviously a five-star receiver. He's scheduled to visit in December. That's a good time for Miami because Miami's going to hopefully at that point put together an offensive improvement and, and generate a momentum. That's the hope as you go into a Wingo visit. So as long as Miami keeps that visit on schedule, which I'm sure they're going to fight for, he, you got a chance. And I know there's a lot of confidence talking to people in Miami. He's been in Miami unofficially. They like the relationship. Also, remember, Miami's recruiting the Midwest a lot. Marquise Lightfoot from Chicago, Justin Scott from Chicago. A lot of these guys – work with similar trainers, similar tournaments, you know, there's relationships there. So Miami is, is confident that they will have a chance at Ryan Wingo. Orange Bowl magic wants to know about Zion Nelson as a lot of Canes fans do. It's another very frequent question. He, he says, is, is Zion Nelson alive? Has anyone attended a funeral? Does he have two functional legs? Him versus Bigfoot in the Easter egg hunt. Who could you find first? So he wants to know about Zion Nelson. Yeah, listen, I asked – I didn't get in this question a lot. So I just straight up asked. I go, will Zion be healthy for camp? And the expectation is yes. He'll play this year, and he'll be healthy. You know, when in terms of the timeline, I'm not sure. But the, the impression I got was he, he'll be here for the year. It's not like a situation where he's going to come in in November or something. Like he'll be here for the season, and he'll be healthy. You never know with injuries, but – you know, when I asked the question, the reaction was positive as opposed to, you know, in the past was more, we'll wait and see. I think that the, the expectation is getting more and more that we're going to see Zion and he may be our starting left tackle this year, which would be ideal. Warrior 808 asks, what players are generating the most buzz in offseason workouts slash activities? Uh, I would say the speed of Tyler Harrell and Chris Johnson. They were compared to Olympic sprinters. Um, Crystal Ball, who's been around speed, said they're the fastest among the fastest guys he's ever seen. So remember, this guy's been in Alabama, you know, Oregon, Miami. When Miami was Miami, so he's he's been around, and he says these guys are as fast as he's seen. Um, Mark Fletcher, just with his size and ability. Marcellius Pulliam, a linebacker, bigger and faster than people expected. Tommy Kinsler, you've seen his size. One name I think is getting a lot of hype. I mentioned in the previous podcast, Jaden Davis, who is kind of like you think you know what you're going to get with him because he's put so much film out there. I think he's a little bigger than people think. Maybe not height-wise, but in terms of his legs and just his body type and explosive strength, I think he's a little stouter than people expected just watching him on film, um, although he is a good tackler on film. So that's been encouraging. But I would say some of those freshman names I mentioned as far as new arrivals generating buzz, particularly the speed of – Tyler Harrell, and Chris Johnson Jr. Well, this next question you kind of 
touched on it there, but how are the two portal wide receivers doing? Do they break the starting rotation? That one from Yumu. Very good chance. I think Tyler Harrell's going to be more of a situational guy. Now, maybe a lot of situations, but I don't think, you know, they're going to use him in a unique way because of his unique ability. He was never a high volume catch guy at any of his stops. It was always about the big play, average 30 yards a catch one season at Louisville. So they're going to try to maximize his touches. I don't know if he's going to come in there and be a starter. He could, but I don't know. I think the battle to watch Shamar Kirk and Jacoby George. I heard Jacoby George is having a good camp. Shamar is pushing him very well, but Shamar also looks good. You know, sometimes with these Juco guys, you kind of say early on, oh, we might have gotten a lemon. That's not the feedback I'm getting on Kirk. He said he looks good, looks big, looks fast, looks twitchy, and he'll battle with with George. And when the pads come on, we'll see what's up. We we ball him, boys. Asks, how do you see the slot wide receiver snaps being allocated? Restrepo is going to play a lot for not just because he's he's tight with TVD, but because the guy is a very talented player. We missed him big time last year. Uh, the tone setting. I think his ability to run after catch is going to impress people this year. You saw a little bit of that in spring. He's got great hands. I think Restrepo is going to play a lot. What's interesting is Ray Ray Joseph, who was here earlier and had a great spring. You saw him in the spring game catching all kinds of passes. I, I was at a practice when he caught like five touchdowns uh, over the course of the practice. I mean, all kinds of touchdowns too. Uh, I want to say it was a, it was the third, it was only his Thursday practices and he was outstanding. Um, he brings a lot to this of the same things to the table as Restrepo in terms of being su super smart, you know, like a 4.0 type kid, super focused on the football field. And if you look at Ray Ray Joseph and some of the pictures of the camp, he's big. He's not tall, but he's getting strong. I mean, he's, he's you know, he's wearing the sleeveless, he's showing off the guns. The guy's putting work in the weight room and he was a running back coming up. So he's got that lower body strength to break tackles. You see that on the film. So him and Restrepo are kind of similar in that way, where they know what they're going to do. They're smart. They're going to get open, but they also can do something after the catch. So I could see him and Restrepo being used, I don't say interchangeably, but in a very similar key role in the offense where both guys can do the same things from an IQ standpoint, from a route running and quickness standpoint, then also from an after the catch standpoint. Next question here from Home Slice. Will we see another quarterback besides Judd? And if so, Portal or high school? If, God forbid, TVD has a season-ending injury. What is the plan with the current quarterback situation? All right, so two different questions there. I would, I was told unequivocally Miami's not going into the next year with three quarterbacks. So we'll see. Is that going to be a transfer? Is that going to be another freshman or another high school kid? I think it's going to depend. Miami doesn't have a high school kid in mind, and they're not going to offer somebody just off a of tape right now. If they see someone throw live, like maybe a Trevor Jackson, I know they have interest in seeing throw live. And others that can change the calculus, but they love Judd. Judd's a rising player based on the off season so far. Hopes he carries into the season, but I think from Miami standpoint, they want to see the freshman throw in person or be a portal kid. But I don't see three three quarterbacks coming into next year. I think it'd be four. Um, as far as the backup for TBD, I know they wanted to get a backup in the portal, but they knew that was going to be a tough road just because who wants to come to be a backup? That's very rare. They're going to see if things, certain situations unfold, and you never know. You can be opportunistic. Things happen. Quarterback's a weird position. Guys come available. They're monitoring that. I don't think they'd be against taking a, a backup even this late, but that hasn't materialized. The feel with Jakari Brown, and I've said this on the podcast, they think he's the man. Like They think Jakari Brown is the future of the program. So it's not like they're trying to avoid Jakari Brown. Jakari Brown would rather redshirt. And to get and have another year of, of experience as opposed to maybe being a package guy when TVD is healthy. But if TVD gets hurt, all bets are off. And, you know, as far as the staff's belief in, in Jakari, obviously they saw him in the scrimmages where he was lighting it up and showing ma major, massive improvement. Spring game, he took a step back. It was his worst practice, unfortunately, in front of everybody. But he's made major gains in the other scrimmages. And I myself am a Jakari believer. I think he's another level of talent than an Emory Williams or a, a Judd Anderson, just in terms of the physical ability, the twitch, the size, the easy arm strength. You can flick the ball and just, you know, with very minimal effort and motion, um, the, the running, the toughness, the leadership. I am a big Jakari Brown fan, and I, I think he's going to be, um, you know, potentially, if he keeps working, 
uh, an excellent, excellent quarterback at the college level, where his running threat has to be respected. Because you say he can't do this or that, he's throwing his whatever. He's he's allowed to run. You know what I mean? This is college football. He's going to run. You don't have to worry about his durability. You only got him for four or three years. You can run him as much as you want. He's going to be able to run. And when you put this offensive line together, he's really going to be able to run. Then it's just a matter of being comfortable in the system and throwing the ball. And I just looked this up. And someone can fact check me, but I just looked this up. The only game on Miami's schedule last year where Miami put up more than 24 points against a Power 5 opponent was Georgia Tech, which Jakari started. So, yeah, you can focus on some of the missed throws. This was an offense that was terrible and didn't serve anybody. I mean, this is a Josh Gaddis offense that was horrible with TVD. He was an experienced quarterback coming off an unbelievable year. So the offense dragged a lot of people down. Jakari did what he could as a true freshman in that offense and still showed poise, showed physical ability, and in his that game against Georgia Tech, put the ball in the end zone and finished the drives with six. So, you know, I am a big fan of Jakari. I saw a lot of progress in the spring. The coaches saw a lot of progress in the spring. Don't judge them just by the spring game. But yeah, if you ask me the quarterbacks of, you know, between Emory, Judd, whoever, who I think is the future quarterback, both this year and then the future, I think Jakari's the guy. Last question here, and this is a Twitter question from Bala Doctor. What is the latest feedback on James Williams and his offseason so far? I've heard that James Williams is is more open to playing sort of a hybrid role. You saw him playing linebacker on third down last year. I think that's going to expand in this Gidry defense, which is all about deception. A guy like James Williams, that's what makes him special, his ability to be so versatile, cover so much ground. When he just spreads his arms at 6'5 with his length, he, just that alone causes problems in the passing game. He had the bad shoulder last year, hurt his tackling, hurt his reputation among Canes fans because he made so many weak tackles with that shoulder. But I think he's still the guy that got excited as a freshman, and I, I'm, I'm told that he's much more open in this Gidry defense to moving around, which is going to, I think, take his career to a whole new level. Well, D, appreciate the info as always. We're going to have Juan Manaya joining the show now, offensive lineman out of New Jersey that I know Coach Mirabal and Coach Cristobal are excited about his potential. We saw them take a Tommy Kinsler, a Frankie Tinelau, and those are the lower rated recruits, right? Just seeing their body types and the athleticism at that like you said, mass and size, sheer size. It's going to be exciting to see what they what they do with guys like him. Well, look at Oregon's offensive line last year, the one with Bo Nix in front of it. Those guys were – look at the recruiting rankings on those offensive linemen. There were a lot of guys that were underrated by recruiting services. But then you look at the product that Mirabal ultimately put together, big, athletic, dominant. So – Mirabal can get guys like Francis and Sampson, but he also likes to get guys that have the traits and develop them. That's what he's banking on with Juan Manai. Excited to hear that interview. Remember, Canes fans, like and subscribe. We will be back next week. If you if you have not had a chance to check out The Bank, it's up there with more detailed info than D uh, got into on this episode. But again, we'll be back next week. Enjoy this interview with Juan Manai. All right, Canes fans, I'm excited to be joined now by 2024 offensive line commit Juan Manaya out of Paramus Catholic in New Jersey. Juan, fresh off your official visit to Coral Gables, back, back home now, but just recap what went on this weekend and your overall experience in Coral Gables. You know, we just did a bunch of things, did a bunch of presentations, position meetings, everything. You know, this weekend for me was really just like, just like taking everything in, but it was just an amazing weekend all around. So I know you've been to Miami before, I think back in April, right? You took an unofficial visit there. I've been um, there twice, twice prior to my official. <clears throat> okay. So how was this time different? And I know you were already committed, but what was it like to get around your future teammates and brothers who were also on their visits? 
So I actually committed after my second visit. So this is my first time being back, like officially committed and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So, you know, it was awesome seeing like all the other commits and stuff. You know, it was just a good all around experience because I'll be sharing the field with these guys soon. So you talked about the position meetings that you guys had. What was it like getting with Coach Mirabal? I know Coach Cristobal is the head coach, but everyone knows that he's an he's an offensive lineman. Uh, that's what he played, and he has a, a soft spot. It seems like for you, for you big guys in the trenches. So, talk about some of the stuff that you learned in those position meetings, and just how excited you are to be able to work with those guys who are known for developing offensive linemen. Man, like one of my biggest things for committing to Miami is the fact that there's four offensive line guys in the room full time. You know what I mean? The head coach is an offensive line guy, so it's serious. And you know, Coach Mirabal, he's a he's a teacher of the game great teacher you know when he talks you really do understand and the information does sink in so you know i'm more than excited to get ready to get to work with those guys man and it must be cool looking in that room and seeing already some of those office linemen who came in from last class they've been getting their work in so i'm sure you had a chance to talk to them and kind of get it you know get a feel for what it's like for them early on yes sir yes i did so Juan. Talk to me a little bit about your athletic background, right? So what what's your height and weight right now, just so the Canes fans understand uh, how massive you are, really? Uh, right now I'm six foot six, 330 pounds. So you being a uh, – you're a big boy, right? I know sometimes youth sports is tough because, you, yep. you know, especially in football you can only, only play certain weight divisions and, and things of that nature. So what was your athletic – background growing up what sports did you play and things like that so my whole life i actually played basketball like i was a basketball player you know i had quote unquote hoop dreams and then <laughs> i got to my freshman year of high school and then it was over after that you know they they brought me out for football and stuff like that and i've stuck with it ever since and i guess it worked out for the most part so you're new to the game i mean and you play a position that obviously is very important, gets paid very well down the line of the next level. Was it an easy decision for you because you stepped on the football field and said, man, this is uh, pretty quick for me to pick up and I'm just bigger uh, than most guys out there? Or was it a decision that was tough for you to make? Because like you said, you did have those hoop dreams. So I'm sure deep down, you still had love for the game. You know, at first it was. Sorry. At first, at first, it was hard learning a new sport and everything, and you know, like that. But, like, the coaches and the people I had to, like, mentor me and stuff like that, you know, and my friends, you know, playing with your friends and everything, you know, you guys get through everything together. So, you know, it was pretty smooth. And then once I saw that I could be good at this, you know, I, like, I, like, dialed in a lot, you know. Right. Give us the scouting report on the basketball court. Because, I listen, I'm a hoops guy, and I, you know, a lot of Canes fans pay attention to the game of basketball. So give us a scouting report and give us a, a comparison, an NBA comparison. Uh, So, you know, like me, I'm like a 6'6 guy. So, you know what I mean? Like I'll never make it as a big man, like further on. But, you know, I was like a, a pretty good post player, pretty good at defense. I could rebound. That's about it. You know, like any traditional big man from back in the day. Right. Compare me to you. Yeah. It's crazy, man. Those guys are those guys are out of style now. You gotta be yep. if you're you seven point, you gotta dribble, you gotta shoot, you gotta move. Uh, I don't think the movement was the issue for you, right? Because everyone yep. knows that you can get up and down get up and down the court. But man, uh it's a different game these days for sure. Yes, sir. Juan, talk to me a little bit about Miami, the culture of the city of Miami, yeah. right? I'm not sure about your your background. Um, but obviously in, in Miami, it's, it's, there are some similarities to New Jersey, but it is, it is a lot different. So talk to me about that aspect of the city. You know, obviously the coaching stuff's great and you know, you're going to get developed there, but when you came to Miami, now third time that you're here, w- what is it about the city that, that you Man, like? Miami is like, obviously a really beautiful city. And like, what I like the most about Miami is how diversified it is. You know what I mean? Like, right. it's not, it's just not, nothing overpowers the other. It's like a lot of different people that come from different ethnic backgrounds. So you guys, everybody's just always mixing and stuff like that. And also the culture of Miami, the school, you just have like, like legends, Miami legends coming back all the time, having talks with the team and stuff like that. 
And there's actually a Miami legend that gave us a speech this past weekend, Coach Alonzo. Mm -hmm. He was there when he um they won the national championship, so ch national championship and stuff like that. So you know, it was great to like hear from him and stuff like that, and how he feels about Miami and the city. You know, Definitely. it was it was truly great. Do you speak any Spanish? Yeah, I'm fluent. So what's your What's your background? I'm Dominican. Okay, you're gonna get some good Dominican food down in Miami. I don't know if you've already had a chance to. Nah, I haven't. You know, see your way around Cuban food, Dominican food, Colombian food. You it's name gonna, it. So you're in. It's gonna take right? a. It's gonna take a very good cook to top my mom's cooking. Uh, oh, listen! I'm not saying it's gonna be mom's cooking. I promise. Yep. I can promise you, it's not gonna be that. But when you're away from home, Miami's the place to be to get at least a taste of it, right? Yes, sir. So what mom, mom, I'm guessing, was all, definitely on board for you coming to Miami. Yeah, of course. You know, mom went to go visit and stuff like that. And, you know, she was she was like, yeah, this is this is definitely it, you know, because she saw it. She saw how happy I was and stuff like that after my second visit. So, right. yeah, you know what I mean? Yes, sir. A couple more questions here before we wrap it up, Juan. On the field, right, I'm sure you, you probably uh, believe you have some room to grow. So give us kind of your biggest areas. Be a little self-critical here. Your biggest areas of improvement on the field and kind of what the Miami coaches have laid out for you, kind of the plan for you over this next, I guess, are you an early en enrollee? Uh, as of right now, no. Okay, so you pretty much have, you know, 10 months to 12 months before you get get on campus. So what are the areas you're going to be focusing on so that you're ready to go once you get here? Uh, you know, just keep getting my feet as quick as possible because at the end of the day, that's what matters the most for an offensive lineman. If you have great footwork, it'll make everything else right. But for me personally, I feel like, you know, I'm going to continue, continue, like, playing at a lower pad level, trying to, play at a lower pad level and just having heavier hands when I'm run blocking. Are you, do you have any goals physically? Are you trying to, you know, lose any, any weight, gain any, you know, obviously everyone wants to gain muscle, but yeah. have they told you anything? Obviously the slimmer you can get, the better it'll help your feet, right? That's generally how it works. Um, but I mean, what's your, I guess my question is what's your summer workout plan look like right now and, and training? You know. Honestly, they told me not to worry about my weight too much. So me personally, I'm just going to continue to just maintain where I'm at, you know, maybe lose like five pounds and just try to get as defined as possible. Definitely. All right, Juan, last question here. What What's your message to Canes fans after this week? And I know, listen, you're not going to give any secrets away, but you there are a lot of big time recruits on campus this weekend. Are you thinking there's going to be a good amount of these guys uh, joining you in the class moving forward? Definitely. I think we're two recruiting classes away from bringing back number six. There you go. It was a great start last year, obviously, with the top 10 class, top five, top 10 class nationally. And looks like they're picking up right where they're le they left off. So Juan, appreciate you joining me today, man. Thank you once again. No problem. Appreciate you.